welcome. We are so glad that you have joined us here through technology to worship with us. This is St. Paul Lutheran Church, and my name is Laura Sechrist, and we are so glad that you are with us today. We believe it's no accident that God brought you to this place to be with us to worship our God on the second Sunday of Advent. At this time, before we begin our service, I'm going to invite you to prepare a few things if you would like to join with us in these different things. First of all, some of you have Advent wreaths at home, and I invite you to have that close by with you. And if you don't have an Advent wreath, if you would like to just get two candles that you would bring close by and then something to light those candles with, we will be participating in that in just a little bit in the service. And the other thing, if you would like to participate in communion today, we ask that you get something for Fruit of the Vine and some bread so that you can participate a little bit later in the service. So I invite you to please pause the video while you prepare those things. And we invite you to engage in our service, to participate in our service fully, whether we are singing hymns of praise, whether we are praying or listening to God's word, to completely put everything else to the side and take that deep breath in and exhale to truly be here in God's presence, filled with the Holy Spirit as we worship our God, a God of hope, a God of love, a God of light. I invite you at this time to please stand where you're at, wherever it may be, and participate in our song of praise as we talk about God's forever reign and God's goodness in all things. You are good, you are good when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love on display for all to see. You are light, you are light when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope.
Jesus, our hope. Jesus loves pure light. And as we observe Advent this year, I invite you again to fully engage in what Advent is all about. The waiting, the waiting for our Savior, the waiting for Him to come. And as we light our candles today, we sing our song as we wait. Pray for God's peace. Christ, Christ is our light and the, and the source of our peace. We witness the hostility between nations and neighbors. Christ, Christ is, is our light and the source of our peace. We see a world full of fractured relationships and unforgiving hearts. Christ, Christ is, is our light and the source of our peace. We seek relief from our own inner turmoil and restlessness. Christ, Christ is, is our light and, and the source, source of our peace. Today we light two candles as Skylar lights them for us. We recognize the candle of hope and the candle of peace. This second candle reminds us that Christ came into our world to restore peace and that only through trust in God's word and his promises can we find our own inner peace. We remember that Christ is the Prince of Peace who taught us that throughout simple acts of love and forgiveness, peace is spread in the world. Amen. Please pray with me. Gracious, Gracious God, God, as we continue, we continue our, our Advent, Advent journey, we, we thank you for sending the Prince of Peace into a world filled with unrest and strife. We ask that you quiet our restless hearts 
and instill in each of us the calm assurance that tells us you are in control, so we need not worry. Give us the tools we need to serve as you would have us serve, and make us willing instruments of your peace. Amen. Good evening, I'm Pastor Rodney. It's good to be with you, whether it's daytime, morning, evening, whenever it might be that you are worshiping with us, I greet you in this energy of the second week of Advent, in this time of preparation and waiting and watching, as Laura mentioned already. The life here at St. Paul is a little bit less active, less hectic than typically this time of year. And we acknowledge that, but we also want to remind you that there are opportunities for you to still participate in the giving tree here uh, at St. Paul and to support some of our local outreach organizations, HACAP and Ally, and some of the families in the area that are needed. Contact the office if you have any questions about that or check the Pulse or our website if you would like to participate in supporting our outreach during this Christmas season. Aside from that, we just invite you to continue to uh, join us during the weekdays at noon. There's opportunity for 10 minutes of midday prayer. There are uh, prayer uh, rituals that went into the homes along with Advent wreaths, and those are available in the Pulse. And we invite you to pray in your homes. Gather your family regularly around the table. Be intentional about remembering that God is with you during this time of waiting and watching. We also encourage you to continue to support the mission and the ministry of St. Paul through your, uh, your offerings, uh, your treasures, returning some of the abundance that God has placed into your lives uh, to us that we might share it out into the community. God blesses our efforts and God blesses you when you respond in worship by sharing back some of what God has placed in your life. And so let us with gratitude pray together for the offerings that we have received. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours. Your faithfulness is everlasting. Receive our offerings and bless them for the health of this community. We pray through Jesus Christ, our word and our strength. Amen. And so let us prepare to hear the word of God proclaimed. The first reading is from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 15a. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. Here ends the reading. The second reading is from Psalm 
chapter 85, verses 1 through 2, and verses 8 through 13. You, Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. Thank you, Darla. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. This is the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah, the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing the sins to him And then they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit. The gospel, the good news of the Lord. So greetings in the name of the one whom we await, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This season of Advent is uh, what we call New Year. Here in the Christian church and we enter now into a new gospel story this gospel that comes to us from St. Mark and Mark we believe was a companion of Paul and and perhaps uh, Silvanus and and he spent time with Paul and and Peter and was with them even in Rome we believe where he wrote his gospel this this good news because why Mark wanted to record something significant in a time when it was called for. See, if you remember back in the 60s in Rome, it became very difficult to be a Christian. There was persecution. There were people being taken to the Colosseum. Paul and Peter were killed. And there was fear that the stories, that the witnesses to Jesus the Christ would fade away. And Mark wrote down his recollection of the stories about Jesus the Christ. And in fact, he tells us right from the very beginning that we heard tonight, what's this gospel about? It's about Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the one who came to fulfill the prophecies. And so Mark's gospel really does a couple of things for us. He explores through the 16 chapters, the mystery of who Jesus the Christ is and the mystery of this reign of God that Jesus is going to proclaim and live and model and initiate and reveal. Mystery. 
mystery. That seems to be what Mark's gospel revolves around. But it's not mystery to keep us in the dark. It's mystery to keep us curious. To keep asking, what more can I know about this Jesus, the anointed one of God, the revealing human, fully like us, the one who would tell us about what it looks like and what it means to live in this kingdom that God desired to establish here on earth more fully. So, you know, I was sitting with Mark's gospel and I I found myself thinking about the last couple of months, my experience here as an American citizen this, this election cycle that we've just come out of, that we've just left behind. And there was clearly a vying for power in the way people talked, in the, the money that was spent, in, in what was said, what was promised. A vying for power. And, you know, we as citizens are expected to trust the candidates. We're expected to trust the process. We're expected to look to those leaders as people who will help to provide for us prosperity, protection, and peace. That's the dynamic that we found ourselves wrapped up in. And what was that experience like for us? I know you've talked about it a lot. You've probably shared with people how you were feeling as it went on. But what I found myself wondering was, is this a little bit of what Mark's community was experiencing in this first century of Rome? Where they were expected to worship the Caesar, the king of Rome? They were expected to be good citizens in the empire, to pay their taxes, to support the leaders? And then to be a Christian, a Jewish Christian on top of it for many of them, and to say, I do not worship the king as the ultimate power. I don't worship the source of power in the king. I don't genuflect to the Caesar's statue. I don't pay my taxes the way others do because I don't support the oppression and the violence and the separation of the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots. And they found themselves at odds with the leadership and with the culture. And they were persecuted for it. To become Christian in Mark or Peter's community was dangerous. It could cost you everything. It could cost you your life. And so there was this great interest in where power lies. And you know, this is where we get this paradigm shift, this viewpoint shift, perspective shift, right away at the beginning of Mark's gospel, where he says to us right off the bat, this power that is present in the Son of God, the King Jesus of Nazareth, is not the same as the power you're used to looking for. I know you're used to crying out to the king and to the leaders and to their armies and their servants and their cabinet for protection and for safety. You look to them as the ones who hold the authority and the power. But see, Jesus the Christ, who holds the authority of God, is completely different than those kings. He does something completely different. And John the Baptist is the one who proclaims this difference. And he says to the Christians, you desire power. The good news is you have it, but you don't have to look to somebody else for it. You don't have to expect somebody else to to liberate you or to protect you. No, what Jesus does is something completely different. I baptize you into this relationship with God. Through water, a purification rite. A rite where you say to other people, I want to be with you. I want to be like you. I want to be a family with you. But Jesus will baptize you with Holy Spirit, with power. The power to live courageous 
lives, being like him in the world. Loving, forgiving, compassionate. When the world turns against you, when you're having things asked of you that you don't believe in, that are hurtful and harmful, you will have the courage and the power of Holy Spirit to move through that and to live through that. Why? Because you are modeling Christ in the world. It could cost you everything. And so, you know, we go to this letter from one named Peter, a community, a Christian community in the first century who was also experiencing this persecution under the Roman Empire, just like Mark's community was. They were suffering, and they were, they were looking for somebody to save them, to liberate them, to make their lives comfortable so they wouldn't be ostracized and cast out. And they were calling for the day of the Lord. There's that phrase again. That day of the Lord where people expected violence and tumultuous uh, weather events when the world would be turned upside down and transformed. But more importantly, those who were faithful, the Christians, would be saved. And all of their enemies would be removed. That's what they meant when they said the day of the Lord. And they were calling for the day of the Lord. And when it wasn't happening, they said in their doubt, in their discouragement, why isn't this happening? Has our God abandoned us? Have we made a mistake? Are we fools? And the author of this letter, one named Peter, says, Don't you understand? God's time is not your time. Sure, God is transforming the world, but not the way that you want it. Stop and think for a second. Hold on. If you call for the day of the Lord today, Think about what the ramifications are going to be for that. Because look around. Look at your families. You are divided. Consider for a second. What would it have been like in the first century to choose to be Christian, to choose to be baptized, to follow Jesus the Christ, the one who was crucified? You know, to become part of the community that's mocked because they follow a God who died. Think about what that would have been like to be a teenager or a young adult who comes home and says, by the way, mom and dad, I've decided I'm going to join a new sect of Buddhism. That's about what it would have been like. I'm going to follow Jesus the Christ. I'm going to commit myself to this community. Do you think that household might have experienced some turmoil? Have you experienced that in your own homes where a family is divided by what people believe and who they're willing to follow? And they're crying out for the day of the Lord, Judgment Day. Get rid of those who are unbelievers. Get rid of those who haven't yet joined the baptized community. And the author says, wait, you're, you're calling for God's judgment against your own family members, against your own flesh and blood. Is that what you want? Do you want to condemn your family because they're slow coming to belief? I love that, that image that Peter says. Wait for the slow ones. <laughs> Imagine for a minute that God is looking at those who do not yet believe, who are still filled with doubt or hurt, or discouragement, is looking at them and saying, I want you with me. And I will give you the time that you need to do that. And that calls on us to change our whole perspective, to consider that God is waiting on the slow ones. You know, I, I, I couldn't get away from this image that I had of a little child, a little toddler, maybe like a three-year-old on one of those little scooters that they sit on and they push themselves along with their own feet. And there's dad and mom, 10 steps ahead of them, constantly turning around having to wait. But they wait and they encourage. And they say, come on, 
Come on, stay on the sidewalk right here. Here's your path. Come follow us. Waiting on the slower one so that everybody can arrive home together. Perhaps that's the image that Peter is putting in front of us when we think about those who are slow coming to faith. Maybe it's people in our own families, our loved ones, our, our friends, that we want to come to this personal relationship with Jesus Christ with us so we can worship together, so we can be involved in acts of charity and kindness and love together. But it isn't on our time. I keep getting taken back to our homes. Especially those homes where that might be the situation, where there is that teenager or young adult or middle schooler who's rebellious right now and, and all we want to do is say, God, take care of this. Get him out of my home. And we're called upon to wait for the slow one. And what are we called upon to do in the meantime? And Peter gives us that beautiful response. Live holy and godly lives. Pure and blameless. So that you're not worrying about judgment. You're not worrying about what's happening to those people. You are simply modeling what is the best about being a Christian. That you are simply pouring love into the situation that those who are slow might move through it at their own pace. That they might ultimately come to the place where God has prepared for them. To come to know themselves as loved. If we could do that in our homes, wouldn't our children know Jesus in a personal way? You know, I mean, if we're called to model Jesus in the world, don't we have to know Jesus? It means that we tell the stories. And this, this Advent and Christmas time, what are they? Filled with stories. And we're going to be telling the stories of Jesus' birth and the proclamation about the kingdom. And that mystery is going to be un unfolding before us. And we're going to be walking in it together. And yeah, we're going to be dragging some people along with us. But we're going to move through it together. Telling those stories. And so, heads of households, domestic churches, this is your time to be Christ for those around you. Not to judge or label or put up expectations, but to simply be who God has called you to be, a loved child. Sharing out those gifts with those around you so that they too can develop that personal relationship with Jesus, that they can know the Jesus they are called to bring to the world. This is all the Father asks of us. It is enough. Let us do it together. I invite you to stand where you are at as we continue worshiping God with our song while we are waiting.
invite you to join with us in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed we say together. I believe, I believe in, in God, God, the Father Almighty, Almighty creator of heaven, heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born, born of the Virgin Mary. Mary. He, he suffered, suffered under Pontius, Pontius Pilate, was, was crucified, died, and was, and was buried. He descended, he descended into hell. hell. On the, On the third, third day, he rose again. He ascended, he ascended into, into heaven and is seated, seated at the right hand of the Father. He will, he will come, come again to judge the living and the dead. And the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic, Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. God of power and might, comfort your people and come quickly to this weary world. We ask you to hear our prayers for everyone in need as we pause to call to mind and heart to those people and situations in our lives that we would like to join to the prayers of the church at this time. Faithful God, you teach us to wait for you with faithfulness and patience. Sustain and support us in our doubts and in our questioning. Walk with us. Accompany us when we are the slow ones. Thank you for waiting on us and for nurturing our faith as we discern and enact your mission. Loving God, you set the stars in the sky and you breathe life into the earth. Renew the face of creation where it is in need of your healing touch. Mend the wounds of environmental damage and restore balance to ecosystems so that all creation can declare your praise. Steadfast God, you never tire of seeking justice. Where people suffer from discrimination, judgment, or injustice, speak words of truth and comfort. Give us leaders with vision for justice. We pray especially for those who are unjustly incarcerated, for those who suffer because of the egos and the hatred of leadership. We ask you to lead us toward a world where faithfulness will sprout underfoot and righteousness rain down from above. God, you are our leader. You ask us to make uneven ground smooth for others. Make even the disparities between your people. Sustain and support people with physical and intellectual disabilities. Accompany disability advocates who work for a world accessible to all. Teach us to celebrate the great diversity in our midst. Tender God, you know sorrow and joy alike. We pray for those in our families and congregation who are not joyful in this holiday season. We pray for families who might be fractured especially because of ideologies or beliefs. Comfort those who grieve. Be a companion to all who are lonely. Tend those who are sick or struggling with depression. We lift up to you, Donna Custis. Continue to pray for Lynn Rickles and Steph Hart. Gather all people into your healing embrace, especially the family members of Darlene Moncrief, who continue to grieve her death. Be with all who are struggling with COVID and the effects of COVID. We give you thanks for the saints who have prepared your way in the wilderness and taught us to continue their faithful work. Make their generous lives an example for all people loving God. 
draw near to us and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Thank you very much. Take a moment to share a gesture of peace with those around you. We may be separated by the walls of our houses, but the peace of Christ flows out into the world. And so we celebrate that peace, that promise of peace. We remember that it was at a meal that Jesus was with his disciples the night that he was betrayed, the night before he died. They were filled with angst and worry, with concern and fear. And so during the meal, Jesus comforted them by promising them that he would always be with them. And so we remember that by singing together, Remember Now My Children. Jesus invites us to share our lives with God by praying the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. My friends, it is Christ who has prepared this sacrament for us and offers it to us at this table that extends out into your homes and into the world. Know the presence and the love of our God by enjoying the sacrament, this gift of bread and wine that has now become for us the real presence of Christ, body and blood. Eat and drink now. Having received the sacrament of life, let us pray together. Gracious and abundant God, you have done great things for us. And we rejoice. In this bread and cup, you give us life forever. In your boundless mercy, strengthen us and open our hearts to our neighbor's needs. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. The creator of the stars, bless your advent waiting. The long-expected Savior fill you with love. The unexpected Spirit guide your journey. 
now and forever. Amen. We invite you to sing our sending song, Prepare the Way of the Lord, as we prepare our hearts and minds for the coming of Jesus. We say together, through the power, through power of the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, we, we go, go into, into the world to creatively connect, connect intentionally grow, and, and joyfully serve. Thanks, thanks be to God. to God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next time.